Good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you again. OK, my pleasure. Uh, Anne, do you want to come and do the first bit of the reading? Is this on for Anne? Good. believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews? Or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous because, by God because of his faith. How did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. So circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith that Abraham had before he was circumcised. Thanks, Anne. Uh, can we have the first slide up, please? Uh, my first question is really about the meaning of life. And uh, I'm saying the meaning of life is found in answer to the question, where do I belong and why? Now, you might think I'm slightly overstating that. Um, but nevertheless, the sense of, you know, who do, where do I belong is quite important to, to, to who I am. And who I am is certainly connected to the meaning of life. Let's have the next slide, the picture. Um, I hope you can see that. Some of you will recognize it. It's, um, Chatsworth House in the background, and uh, there's a couple in the foreground, and the man is the 12th Duke of Devonshire, and next to him is his wife. And, and obviously they're part of, uh, you know, an illustrious family with a history going back to at least the 6th century, and maybe 16th century, and maybe before that. And uh, Chatsworth House is, I guess, where they belong. Um, it does get you thinking, though, of course, they, they kind of joined that family in different ways. Um, the man joined the family when he was born because his father was the 11th Duke of Devonshire. Uh, but his wife would have joined the family at a later point when she kind of married into the family. And, and I, I want to kind of think about, sort of explore this sense of what would it be like to join a family with a long and distinguished history, you know, where you kind of wander around the rooms and there'd be pictures up of, you know, great grandfather so and so and what they did. Um, so, so that's what we're going to think about a bit. Let's have the next slide. Um, I guess being accepted into a family like that, one with a big history, would be, uh, you know, would be no small deal. 
and, and you might say, well, how do I get accepted into this family then? Well, somebody might say, well, you know, learn the history, the family traditions, follow the rules, kind of fit in, and you'll, and you'll be part of the family. Uh, uh, and somebody else might say, well, you know, don't even try, just kind of go off and, and, and do your own, your own thing. And um, let's, have the, let's have the next slide. Supposing we're thinking about a family that's not a kind of British aristocratic family with a history back to the 16th century. We're thinking about a family with a much, much older and longer history. Um, do, do we join this family? You know, where do Christians, particularly Christians who are Gentile Christians, fit in with the history of the Jewish people? Um, you know, when we think about something like Moses leading the people out of captivity in Egypt, do we think, well, that's kind of the history of how God rescued the Jews? Or do we think, actually, this is part of my history because I feel myself to be part of this family? And, and, and how do I kind of regard the Old Testament? Is the Old Testament um, really the kind of holy book of the Jews, which it clearly is, but is it actually kind of my book? How do I relate to um, the Old Testament? And, and these have always been big questions since the early days of Christianity. So let's take that just a little bit further. Let's have the next slide. And this is some of the context that Paul's speaking into. So in terms of people who were saying, well, join the family, be accepted, learn the rules, there were some believers who were saying, this is from Acts, some believers are saying it's necessary for them, in other words, for Gentiles who are joining, it's necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. And, uh, you know, I think we kind of got to understand probably where they're coming from. Uh, at the very beginning, the early church is very largely Jewish. And actually, in some places, it stays very largely Jewish, for example, in Jerusalem. And, um, you know, if, you've, if you were born as a Jew and you've been circumcised and you kind of grew up keeping the laws, at least some of them, and knowing the Ten Commandments and so on, um, and, and then you're hearing about the church expanding and lots of people who are not Jews coming in, maybe that feels a bit threatening. And you think, well, actually, you know, no, being a Christian is about, it's also about being Jewish. So we need to tell these new people who are coming into the church, uh, of course they're welcome, but the rules are, you know, kind of be circumcised and keep the law. And, and that's some of what uh, the context is here. That's what Paul's speaking into in this part of Romans. So what's Paul's answer? Um, well, that's the next slide. It's actually quite a powerful answer, but we'll spend a bit of time exploring it. Can we have the, the next slide? Right, actually. I'll, I'll just talk about the picture first, in case you're wondering. Uh, the picture's got nothing to do with Paul. That's Bess of Hardwick, who was one of the big founders of the Cavendishes, you see. But what Paul is saying, you know, you're saying, well, this is the tradition. This is the history of the family. Get circumcised and, and keep the law. Actually, you've got the family history all wrong. And he says, I'm going to illustrate that by talking about two of our most important uh, ancestors. And I'm going to talk about Abraham, the very founder of the Jewish faith, and David. And I'm going to say, actually, they didn't get accepted with God by being circumcised and keeping the law. They got circumcised with God by, by faith, by believing. That is potentially a very, very powerful argument. Next slide. Of course, the, you know, really from, certainly from the second century onwards, right down to the present day, there have been some people who have said, well, you just go the completely opposite way with us. Actually, no, we don't, you know, we don't, we're not connected to the Jewish family. Their history is not our history, and uh, you kind of let's not have the Old Testament, and, uh, you, you know, we're not joined in with us. That's that bad old thing. We've got this new thing, and it's not about that. So it's don't join the family. Go off and do your own thing. And I've just got, uh, I mean, this is, has been a problem in the church on and off from the second century onwards. But I'll just, I'm going to illustrate it a little bit. The, the flag that you can see in that picture is of um, a movement in Germany from the uh, early 1930s until uh, just about the end of the Second World War. And, and they call themselves German Christians, Deutsche Christians. That's where the DC came, come from on the flag, Deutsche Christians. And you can probably tell by the logo where their, where their actual influence was coming from. But clearly, you know, they said, well, we, we, you know, we can't have the Old Testament. Let's kind of get rid of the Old Testament. 
Um, oh, and by the way, actually, it turns out that bits of the New Testament are quite Jewish too, so we better rewrite that. And actually, they rewrote the New Testament and called it something called the message of God. Um, actually, that's very telling, you know, because e even down to our time, there'll be some people who say, you know, have nothing to do with the old, that Old Testament thing. No, it's, you quickly find that people who talk like that actually are very quickly ignoring big chunks of the New Testament as well. So, um, and the picture of the, of the guy on the right is of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a young pastor in the church who stood out against this. Only one of um, a number, but still actually a minority in Germany at the time, who is saying, you know, this is not the right thing to do. This is completely wrong. And in the end, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer was, was killed by the Nazis. So, you know, it is an issue, um, but it's one that uh, we would be right about. Let's, uh, let's move on and have the next slide. I'm just slightly changing the picture here. Um, let's not think about a family and joining a family. Let's think about j joining a club. And I guess when you're, you're thinking about joining a club, uh, there's three things that kind of come into the picture, aren't they? One would be eligible. Am I, am I eligible to join the club? Um, two, what are the rules of the club? Am I going to be OK with the rules of the club? And then, and then fees, you know, how much does it cost to join this club? And I think, effectively, the, the, the people that um, kind of Paul was aiming at this would sort of say, well, they'd say, on eligibility, well, um, ideally, you should be Jewish. Um, but if not Jewish, well, at least prepared to kind of convert to, to be Jewish. So you kind of accept circumcision. You're coming into Judaism. Um, rules, we've got stacks of rules. We've got this very old rule book, and, and, and there's no shortage of rules. So yes, we've got plenty of rules here. Um, fees, well, uh, you know, kind of keep the rules, and, and the, keeping the rules is the fee, really, is, is, is I guess, what, what they would say. So, so what does Paul say about this? What's his answer, and how is that different? Um, well, the first thing, eligibility. He says, well, actually, absolutely anyone can apply to join this club. Absolutely anyone. So it doesn't matter about your ethnicity. It doesn't matter about the color of this, your skin. It doesn't matter about your upbringing. It doesn't matter which kind of part of so, society you come from. It doesn't matter if you can't read and write or if you've got three degrees. None of that matters. Eligibility is absolutely open to everyone, and that's incredibly important. Rules? Well, actually, there's really only one rule, and that is trust Jesus Christ completely. That's the rule. Fees? You might be expecting me to say the, there's no fee. But actually, I'm gonna, uh, uh, we'll come back to this later if, you, if, if this leaves you puzzled. The fee is astronomically expensive. Um, and I'm told that the, the, the most expensive golf club, I'll look this up on Google, most expensive golf club in the world, they said that they think the entrance fee is, is to join up for the first time is a million dollars. I think that tells you that some people have definitely got more money than sense, doesn't it? But, um, but actually, that, that's quite small to the entrance fee required to bring you into the family of God. And we'll come back to that. Let's have the next slide. Uh, this is actually, this is quite a key verse, certainly a key verse in chapter 4, It's probably a key verse in this whole section of Romans, if not in the entire book. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, let's start with the word righteous. I, I, righteous is one of those words that um, preachers use a lot. But, but actually doesn't necessarily mean a lot to modern ears, particularly if you kind of don't have a big church background. So I'm just going to try and unpack that a bit. And actually, I, I, I don't think I knew that until this week, but righteous is a word that was kind of used for the first time by William Tyndale. So William Tyndale is, is um, one of the early translators of the Bible into English, hugely influential figure in the church and actually in the English language. And... Tyndale took an older Anglo-Saxon word called right wiz, so right with W-I-S at the end of it, right wiz, and translated it righteous. And put, um, once it got into the Bible, and the Bible starts getting printed, the word sticks. But right wiz in, in modern English would mean something like right ways. So somebody who's righteous is somebody who's living in the right way, who's consistently following the right ways. Um, Next, let's look at this word counted. 
Um, that's quite important. Some translations uh, put it, use a slightly different words. All the translations often use the word called reckoned. Um, some translations talk about credited. But all of those words have got kind of association with the world of money and finance and accounting. And that, that is exactly the, the origin of it. So, so we're, we're thinking money for a minute. So imagine your bank account. And uh, you know when you kind of spend money, money goes out. It's debited, isn't it? Then when money comes in, it gets credited to your account. And um, what Paul is saying is in a sense that, that God has credited Abraham's account with something. Now again, as Paul unpicks, there's, there's two sorts of money that can come, well, at least two sorts of money that can come into your bank account, that can get credited. A lot of the time, it's stuff that you've earned or are entitled to. So, you know, if you've got a job, you get your wages. Maybe if you've got a pension, you know, the money comes in. So, so this is stuff that you kind of earned or in some way are entitled to. But then maybe, uh, and probably this doesn't happen nearly as often as you would like, it, you know, you get a completely free and unexpected gift. And suddenly, well, that's great. You know, something has, something has been gifted into my account. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But nevertheless, there it is. And my balance on my account has gone up because of that. And that's really what Paul is talking about here. And it's also worth thinking about. You see, Abraham isn't righteous. You know, he's not the worst guy ever. He's not the best guy ever. He's a guy who sometimes gets stuff right, and a lot of the time gets stuff wrong. In fact, he's somebody very much like you and I. So Abraham is not righteous, but God credits him with righteous. God gives him that. God pays righteousness into his account, if I can put it that way. So he kind of comes out of it all being righteous because God has credited something, put something into his account which he didn't earn, didn't deserve, and probably wasn't expecting. So, so that's key, and it's, it's going to be key, and we'll come back to that and ask why, if that was what was happening with Abraham, how important it is to this big question. Next slide, please. And actually, this time, um, Paul started talking to another of those famous ancestors of the Jews, David, King David, a um, huge figure in Judaism and also seen as being uh, you know, the king who is the direct ancestor of the Messiah. So David is enormous. And um, Paul's actually going to make exactly the same point based on David, but he's just looking at it from the other side of the bank account. And so he's quoting David, who wrote Psalm, the Psalm we now know as 32. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. And again, we're back with the, the, the you know, the world of finance and money and accounting. But this time, instead of something, in a sense, being credited in, something else is being taken out. And um, so I want you to imagine this. You, you sort of um, look at your bank account, and actually your bank account is in a terrible state, and you're massively overdrawn, and you're thinking, like, there's no way that I can, I can ever get out of this. It's just I'm too far over, I, you know, I'm... I'm I'm at bankruptcy's door here. I cannot get out of this situation. And then um, a, a bit later, a few days later, maybe a week or so later, you kind of check your balance online or, or put your card in the hole in the wall machine, and your balance comes up. And you, you, you're not in overdraft. Actually, you've got a credit balance. You think, well, well how did that happen? How could, I, how could I have gone from being massively over, overdrawn to, to having an account that's backing credit? Um, and then a letter arrives from the bank and it explains all this. And the letter from the bank says, um, uh, acting on the instructions of our owners, we've transferred the following debits out of your account and put them into his account instead. And then we attach a revised statement. You look at the revised statements and all those nasty debits, all that expenditure that you now can no longer afford or pay for has been removed from your account and it's been put in somebody else's account. And you think that's marvelous. And, and, and that's what's happening it's actually, it's actually the same thing. It's not a different process. It's the same thing he's talking about with Abraham. Is that, you know, but this time God is kind of taking the bad stuff out. It's the same process. We're getting given something that we didn't deserve and didn't earn. And, and that's um, you, you're really incredibly important and marvelous. Sometimes I think we think of forgiveness. We think, well, you know, uh, God loves me and that's why he forgives me. And that's absolutely true, by the way. But I think it can, it, it doesn't quite go 
as far as it could do in understanding this. So let me, let me give you another example. And I mean, this may even have happened to somebody in the room. I imagine that um, somebody in your family has got hold of your credit card. And they, perhaps they know your pin or whatever. Anyway, they've, they've bought things and they've been quite extravagant. And they've, effectively, they're taking your money and they've bought stuff that you hadn't authorized them to, but they've effectively stolen your money. Anyway, it all comes out and, you know, words are said and, oh, oh gosh, this is awful. But, you know, you love them and, and they love you and they say sorry and, and you say that you love them. And, and so you say, well, I'm, I'm going to forgive you then. And, and that's good. But the question still arises, who's going to pay the credit power bill? You know, the bill's still going to come in. Somebody's got to pay it. And so, you know, when God forgives us, it's not just because he's a nice guy and, 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 and wants to kind of love you. He's actually he's p he's settling the bill. He's settling the account. And that's what I meant when I said, um, you know, um, the fee for entry to the Christian family is astronomically high. But God has met the cost in Jesus Christ. Can we actually, if it's not too much trouble, can we go back a slide? Back to Abraham. Yeah. And there's one other thing I wanted to pick up at this, because it's about faith in all this. Because I think there's a danger. We see the faith. We think of, is faith then just a different way of earning God's approval? So, you know, imagine somebody saying, well, you know, the Jews believe that the way to earn God's approval, the way to earn God's favor, was to kind of keep the commandments and follow the rules. I'm a Christian. I see the way I need to earn God's approval is, is by my faith. And I got belief strongly in God, and, and after I've earned God's approval. And you might think, well, does anybody think that way? Um, but you can see in that, it's just become another way of earning. Just in, the currency has changed. Instead of it's a currency of keeping the rules, it's now a currency of faith. And you might say, oh, come on. You know, nobody would ever talk that way. Mm, maybe not. But have you ever been in a situation, maybe you've been praying for somebody, perhaps that person is ill and it's somebody very special to you. Think, if only I can gather together every penny of faith I've got, maybe God will do something here. Is that not coming dangerously close to the same thing? You know, if I can only get enough faith together, um, you know, we're still thinking of faith, actually. Faith is putting the emphasis in a completely different place. Say, this is God's free gift. So the emphasis is on the giver and what God gives. Not on the faith, even though the faith is, is, is part and parcel of it. Let's, um, let's go forward again. And again. And again. Um, I, and I just start to mention this. This is, this is, I think, is quite an, We can think of all this. Well, this is, you know, this is what Paul and actually the other apostles are teaching, and that's great. So they're teaching about you know, the way into God's family is just by believing. And that's absolutely true. But, you know, there's something else here. It's actually the apostles, even Paul, to some extent, catching up with what the Holy Spirit is already doing on the ground. So all of this time, lots of Gentiles hearing about Jesus. This sounds fantastic. I'm believing in him. And they're flooding into the church. And they're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was scary. So it says the circumcised believers who come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. So God is, God is absolutely doing something. And the teaching and what God is doing are in perfect agreement with each other. This is what God is doing, and, and that's kind of matched and reinforced by uh, the teaching we're seeing. Next slide. Abraham, his story, his faith, and his ups and downs. So I've got to tell a bit the story of Abraham, but um, before I do that, we'll have Anne come and do the second reading. Thank you. This is uh, Romans 4, verses 16 to 25. So, the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. And this happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead 
back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason to hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. But Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. See, um, when Abraham born, he's just a kind of regular Gentile pagan like everybody else at the time. So that's his background, you know. Um, he, but then he has this kind of encounter with God, and, and God makes a promise to him and Abraham decides that he's going to trust in that. And, and that's where we get to Genesis 15, 6, which is the verse that Paul has been quoting. And God, you know, kind of credits righteousness to him. So all this happens um, before he gets circumcised. Abraham does get circumcised, but not actually quite a long time after this. So this is well before circumcision. And actually the law, as we know it later, with the Ten Commandments and all the other rules, that's several hundred years still in the future. So part of what Paul's argument is, it can't be necessary, in other words, it can't be essential to be circumcised and follow all the rules, because none of those things applied to Abraham when he first got in a good position with God, when he was declared righteous with God. And, and it's quite a telling argument. Um, but there is something else. There's a, it, if, if you kind of read both what's written in Romans 4 and what's written in Genesis, you might think there's a slight disconnect. Because in the passage that Anne's just read, Abraham comes across strongly as a, as a really great guy. And it, it says something about, you know, his faith doesn't waver and all the rest of it. Um, but when you read Genesis, actually, it doesn't seem that clear. Yeah, Abraham, you know, fantastic figure and, and, and all the rest of it, but it, it, it definitely has some very bad moments. So, so what's, what's kind of going on here? Why has Paul chosen not to mention or even allude to some of the things that, that Abraham was getting wrong? Well, I think one possible answer to that is that, you know, Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Spirit, is describing Abraham as somebody who's had their sins forgiven, who's had those debits removed from their account. So I'm not going to repeat the things that, that Abraham got wrong. I'm going to talk about his righteousness, his righteousness given by God. I'm not going to repeat that. And that's, it's a wonderful thought. Um, and it's a wonderful thought from up there. Actually, you know, God looks at us in Jesus Christ and doesn't see the miserable sinner that we see. He sees something different. And there's that verse that, uh, in the New Testament that can sometimes see quite challenging when, you know, uh, Jesus says uh, at, the, at the end, the final judgment, well done, good and faithful servant. And um, you kind of look at your own life. I look at my life and you think, mm, uh, good and faithful servant? Well, maybe sometimes, um, consistently all the time? Definitely not. But I say, you know, 
because of what God has done in, in crediting righteousness to our account and removing those debits, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So this is about, you know, the life of faith. And um, it's an extraordinary story. Let's have the next slide. So Paul says that, um, and I'll read it here, but I'll also, if you do have your Bibles open, not everybody wants to do that, but if you do, you can have a quick look. Abraham is the father of those who have faith but are on the outside. And then says, Abraham is also the father of those on the inside, but only if they have the same kind of faith he did when he was still on the outside. Now, let me, let me just talk about this for a minute. Too. First of all, Paul's saying, and, and if you're kind of reading your Bible, you're, this is probably what you'll see, is that Abraham is the father of those who have faith but are not Jews. So if you're a Gentile, you're uncircumcised, it might say in some of your versions, then Abraham is still your father, even though you're not a Jew. And, and I think that does have implications for how we look at the Old Testament, um, the story of Abraham, but actually the whole story of the Old Testament. So, you know, when we see Moses leading the people out of the promised land, it's not just something he did for the Jews. That's part of my story. This is my history. That belongs to me because, you know, Abraham is my ancestor. I'm belonging to this family. And Abraham is the father. And then he says something. Um, he says he's also the father of those who are Jews, who are circumcised. But only if they have the same faith that Abraham did, if they were, you know, um, before, before Abraham became a Jew, as it were. And, um, and that would have been quite controversial. You know, some people in the church, and certainly Jews outside the church, would, would not have liked that. Um, actually, um, Jesus put it, I mean, Jesus actually has an argument with the Pharisees. You can read about this in, in John chapter 8. Jesus is in an argument with the Pharisees. And they're saying, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus says pretty much, oh, no, you're not. If you were children of Abraham, you would be following his example. But actually, you're trying to kill me. So you're not children of Abraham. And uh, it's, sometimes people think, oh, you know, I find kind of Paul and, and Paul's letters all a bit kind of tough. And, I, you know, just give me some nice kind of Bible stories from, from the Gospels. Um, very often you find that, that Jesus is saying the same things that Paul's saying. Actually, he tends to say them a lot more bluntly. Uh, and Jesus says, you know, you're not children of Abraham. Actually, your father is the devil. You can, you can read about it in, in John 8. Um, but you will notice that, that in, in the slide I put up there, I haven't, I haven't used words like Jew and non-Jew, and I haven't talked about circumcised and uncircumcised. I've talked about inside and outside. So, so why have I done that? Well, I think the reason is simply is I, I think... Sometimes when we, we kind of read a passage like this and we get to a bit about the Jews, we think, oh, well, that's, you know, I'm not a Jew. That's about the Jews. It's got nothing to say to me. And we kind of move on to the next bit. And actually, I think this has a lot to say to us Christians. And we need to hear it. And, but sometimes changing the language just helps us to get the point. So he's saying that, you know, somebody who is on the outside, somebody who has never been to church, who's got no family history of going to church, who's never really been involved in Christianity, is only that far from the kingdom of heaven. All they need to do is to believe in Jesus, and then they're full members of the family of God. That's all that's required. It's that one step. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're only that far from being full and complete members of the family. And on the other side, well, of course, you know, if you're a Christian and you believe in God, you too are a member of the family of God. But, you know, you could have been brought up entirely in Christianity. You could trace back two or three generations in your family of people who have been enthusiastic Christians, maybe somebody who had been a missionary abroad and all the rest of it. But if you don't have the same faith, you're not part of the family of God. That's what he's saying. You can only count Abraham as your father if you share the faith. Um, something else I want to say about Abraham, because we're talking a lot about faith, and I think, I think sometimes we can have a kind of a weak or maybe an incomplete understanding of faith. So I've got a bit of an example for you. I want you to imagine it's been, it's been a cold winter, so there have been a lot of days when it's below freezing point. 
And we're gathered outside around a big pond, and the pond is covered in a layer of ice. And there are kind of people looking at the ice and discussing the ice and thinking about what they think about it. And one group were saying, um, don't go on the ice. It's not safe to go on the ice. We don't know how thick it will be. Don't go on the ice. And then another group are, think, are saying, no, actually, we've kind of looked at this, and we're convinced that that ice would definitely hold somebody's weight. That, that is definitely the case. And then there's a smaller group, and, and they've actually started to, to venture onto the ice. Maybe a bit timidly at first, but they're venturing onto the ice. Which of those three groups has got faith? Well, the first group clearly don't have faith. They don't believe that the ice is strong enough to support them. They definitely don't have faith. The second group think they've got faith because they've convinced themselves that the ice is strong enough. But do they have faith? The third group who have ventured out onto the ice, well, they, they clearly do have faith. And I think when you read Abraham's story, um, it's very much faith in the venturing onto the ice sort. You know, it's very much faith in the doing. And it's quite interesting that when, in the book of James, James is looking at an example saying, well, you know, it's not just about what you say you believe, it's about what you do. Who does James look to for an example? He picks Abraham. The very same example that Paul's giving is an example of a man of faith. So faith is, faith definitely involves kind of leaning on, trusting on, depending on something. It's not just about agreeing with the teaching of the church or accepting that certain facts are true. There is a, there is a kind of trust element to faith. Let's have the, the next slide, please. So I've got a picture of a, a blood pressure monitor up there. And I, I want you to imagine um, another story. If you imagine a story, and um, a patient has been in to see the doctor. And the doctor says, well, we've obviously got some concerns here. I'm going to give you a blood pressure monitor, and I want you to um, take your blood pressure regularly, and I'll, I'll see you. <coughs> and, and so the person goes off with the blood pressure monitor quite happy. Anyway, about two weeks later, the patient's back seeing the doctor and saying, this blood pressure monitor, you know, it's completely useless because I've been taking my blood pressure every day, just as you said, and I've followed the instructions really carefully, and my blood pressure hasn't come down at all. It's exactly the same as it was, so it's just useless. Will you please take it away? You can imagine the doctor thinking, oh, I've got the right one here. But the doctor's thinking, well, let me explain this. This is not a tool. A blood pressure monitor is there for diagnosis. It's not there for treatment. So that will tell us if you've got a problem with your blood pressure. In order to treat you, we've got a different set of tools. And that's a bit in the way that we should understand those laws, including the Ten Commandments. I, I put the eighth one up there. Is, you know, they're there for diagnosis. They tell us where we need treatment. They point out where we're going wrong, where we need help. But treatment requires different tools. Treatment requires Jesus Christ. It requires Jesus Christ giving us something that we didn't deserve and haven't earned. Next slide. Mm. This, is, um, this is from the World Blessing song. You, you, it's certainly on YouTube, but certainly it's on, it's on the internet. And um, I mean, I found this incredibly moving. And um, one of the things that's moving about it, you're obviously seeing Christians from all sorts of corners of the world, aren't you? And, and kind of singing and joining together in praise from, from every background, tribe, and nation. This is what God promised Abraham. You will be the father of many nations. This is what we're seeing. And it's so exciting that that's the case. You know, we're part of a multicultural, multinational, multidiverse people of God. And, you know, Abraham and David and Moses and Elijah are our ancestors. And we're fully part of the family of God through Jesus Christ. And it's incredibly exciting to be part of something that's so big and so enormous. And I'll just add, I think, you know, in, in recent years, I think MCF has become more diverse. And that is awesome. I love it. I love the fact that actually we might only be in a small sense, but we're from every tribe and nation. That's so exciting. It's what God promised Abraham, and it's what the future will look like. This is what heaven is going to look like. People from every tribe and nation. It's so exciting. And will you um, kind of finish for us with a reading? You can ask me to sing it. <laughs> 
You can if you want, as long as you don't ask me to. Uh, we're going to finish um, reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for those words. Father, we thank you um, that we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses from every tribe and nation who are urging us on in our faith, Father. But, um, but actually, Lord, our eyes are not on the crowd, they're on, they're on Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look to you. You are our only hope, Father. And uh, we look to you. And uh, Lord, keep us close to you, we pray. Keep us walking with you. Lord, we want to enter into this family to the fullest possible extent, to receive all that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you will do for us, all that you are doing in us now. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you.